seated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Is God, isn't God awesome? God is awesome. Tell your neighbor that God is awesome. Tell your other neighbor, not that one, the other neighbor. God is awesome. Turn around or turn in front of you and tell the row in front of you or behind that God is awesome. God is awesome, amen? I mean, come on, God is awesome, right? Man, God is awesome. When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the Ritz. You know, there's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. He's awesome. He's awesome. And uh, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Why don't you tell your neighbor that too? Lest we forget, Jesus is alive. Somebody in the front, tell somebody in the back that Jesus is alive this morning. All right, let's hear it. Okay. He is. God is awesome and Jesus is alive. I just thought we should clear up a few things before we jumped into what we're going to look at this morning. How's that? All right. This morning, we are continuing our series on looking to Jesus. And we've been looking at different elements of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his heavenly ministry. And the, the, uh, the real aim in this is so that we, in looking to Jesus, can then in turn have the strength, have the conviction, the boldness, the example to live a life like Jesus. And this morning we are going to talk about Jesus as a high priest. Now, for many of you, uh, the term high priest may not be familiar. You may think of a priest as someone uh, that, that led the church that you grew up in or something like that. Uh, but high priest in the Bible was the main man that represented God to the people. He represented God to the people and was the main uh, recipient recipient of uh, the work that God wanted done for the people on their behalf. A high priest would be known as someone that would mediate or intercede between the people and God. In the Old Testament, one of the main ways that people worshiped God was they would offer sacrifice, not just for their sin, but even thanksgiving and, and praise. They would offer uh, things that would honor God, like the best of their crops or the first part of their crops. Uh, oftentimes, they would dedicate their children and bring them into God's temple to honor God with this blessing that they received. And the guy that would receive these, uh, these sacrifices and administer them for the people was the high priest. All right, was the high priest. The high priest would uh, teach the people. He would tell them about God. He would teach them the laws of God. He would, teach, he would judge between the people, and he would help them know about the Lord. And then there was this one great event every year that was so significant to the people. It was the most holy day in the year of the people of God. It was a day called the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement. Some of your Jewish friends may celebrate still. This day is called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And what this Day of Atonement was all about was it was the one day a year where this one man, the high priest, was able to enter that place, that one place on the whole planet, the whole face of the earth, which was representative of the very presence of God, a place called the most holy place or the holy of holies. So in the tabernacle or in the temple, which was the place where the people worshiped God, there was this one, one special spot that nobody could enter into. In fact, if you even got close and if you even got into the outer court of this holy, holy place, you would be killed. If you weren't killed by the very presence of God zapping you, the command of the people was to stone you. You could not enter this place where God's presence dwelt, except if you were this high priest on this one day a year. It was a very special day. It was a very holy day. It was called the Day of Atonement because it was that one time a year where entering into God's presence with their sacrifice, they could receive forgiveness for their sins. This was this high priest's job. Now, while this was wonderful, it was limited. Because as wonderful as the high priest might have been, he himself was a sinner. He himself was limited. When the high priest died, guess what? No more high priest. His son would then take over and serve as high priest. 
But then he would die, and a new man would come and fill this place. So they were limited because of their weakness, and they were also limited because they could only enter God's presence once a year. So with that uh, small background and, and that small foundation, I want to look at what it means that Jesus is our high priest. Jesus, also like this high priest, is our representative for God. He is the one that came to teach the people about God, to represent what it meant to know God, what it looked like to follow God. We know that Jesus also made atonement for the people, did he not? Did Jesus then bring all of the sacrifices that all of us have made of our lamb and our goat and our cow or our wheat or, or our grain and bring it into the most holy place? Is that how he made atonement for us? No. How did Jesus make atonement? What blood was brought into the presence of God? His own blood, right? What a great high priest he is. For he did not bring the blood of all of the sacrifices of the people then to have to do it all over again. But he brought his own perfect blood and offered the sacrifice. There's a lot that goes into it being uh, Jesus being a high priest. But the main one I want to focus on today is that through Jesus as our high priest, we can have access and have help from this great high priest. From this great high priest. In Hebrews chapter 2, we'll get started. Verse 14, talking about the high priest, talking about the people of God. It says that, therefore, since the children, right, talking about mankind, share in flesh and blood, he, talking about Jesus, also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and through this sacrifice might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. For he, talking about this great one Jesus, does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. That's another term for the people of faith. The first thing that the writer of Hebrews wants to make clear to us is that Jesus gives help to the people of faith. Jesus gives help to the people of faith. Verse 17, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a what kind? Merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, which is a sacrifice, for the sins of the people. So what it tells us is Jesus was just like us, a man. He was susceptible to sin. And because of this, as our high priest, he's merciful and faithful. And then here's this great verse, verse 18. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Let's read that again. For since he himself, Jesus, was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Anyone want to include themselves in that? Holy brethren, are there any holy brethren or sistren here this morning, right? Partakers of the heavenly calling. What our, what our, uh, our task for this morning is, is to consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Look at chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Listen to this great verse. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in how many things? In all things as we are, yet the difference between him and us is what? Without sin. Jesus was tempted in all of the same things that you and I were tempted in. Isn't that amazing to think about, right? This wasn't some facade. He wasn't pretending. Jesus truly was tempted at all points. He was susceptible to make the very same choices that you and I make wrongly, yet he made them rightly. Jesus was tempted at all points, yet without sin. Verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, man, these are just some of the most incredible verses in all of Scripture. 
We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Why? Because he was tempted in all the same things we are, yet he didn't sin. And in light of that, we just read in chapter 2, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. When someone has a baby in our culture, most often in, in, uh, in many families, one of the th first things that happens, new mother and the new father bring this new baby into their home. After the father freaks out, they come into the home, they put the baby in the nursery, and soon after that, one of the first things that will often happen in these situations is who will come visit? The mother of the new mother, right? Any ladies do that? Did anybody have their mothers come or were a mother that came, right? So Jess and I bring the baby home, and then one of the first and primary people that's there is Jess's mom, Rose. My mother, when she lived in North Carolina, would fly to be there and take over the next week. She's already making plans to do that with the new baby. One of the first things that happen is uh, a mother comes to be with this new mother. You know why? Because they can sympathize with the situation. With the situation. How great is it in those circumstances to have someone that already went through it and knows what it is like, even if it was 20, 30 years before, they remember what it's like. And the new mother can ask questions to the, the, the senior mother and say, well, is this how it was for you? And the mom can go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like this. You were rough. You were rough. Usually they always reference that, right? They remind the, the new mother how they were, right? They can sympathize with the situation because they've been there, they've gone through it, they know what it's like. That's the same thing we're talking about, about someone who is sympathetic to the plight of you and I in our temptation with sin. Jesus knows what it is like to be tempted. And because of that, he is sympathetic to the situation. And it says in chapter 2, verse 18, comes to the aid of those who are tempted. How about that? Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? This great, uh, this great word, uh, grace, from chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, look at this definition. This is just from the Merriam-Webster's de definition. Grace is unmerited divine assistance. Unmerited mean undeserved. Divine assistance given humans for their regeneration or sanctification. This is just the first. This is the first definition from Merriam-Webster, right? Anybody could find this out. This isn't like the big theological dictionary that would have confused all of us. I like this one, right? Grace, unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. This is what we are talking about. Jesus giving to the people in need of this very thing. He's gone through it. He knows what it's like and offers grace in time of need. Offers grace in time of need. Through Jesus, through Jesus, God provides mercy and grace for his people. I want you to look at uh, some of the verses uh, that Paul writes about. Romans uh, chapter 1. He, Paul's writing to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. What? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. See what that says? Paul, when he starts his letter, he, he's... He's praying that grace and peace would come from whom? From God the Father and from who else? Jesus, right? We know that God gives grace. But Paul also includes, because he understands the very things we're looking at, that also one of the givers of this grace, this unmerited divine assistance, is the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, he ends the letter by saying this in Romans chapter 16. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of who? The Lord Jesus, right? Be with you. Not that the Father no longer is giving grace, but that Paul is aware that one of the ways that God helps his people in this age while we are tempted is through Jesus giving grace because, after all, he knows what it's like. He was tempted in all points, and he is able to give this assistance to the people when they need it. Next verse here in 1 Corinthians 1, start of the letter, grace and peace to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way the letter ends in chapter 16, Paul says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Right? It's not that he's forgetting about the Father, but he recognizes the unique way that Jesus as the high priest can give assistance to his people. 
God never sins. God, it says, is not even tempted to sin. God is awesome. When he rolls up his sleeves, he's not just putting on the Ritz. Okay? Jesus never sinned either, but he was tempted. He could have sinned. He was a man like us. And yet after his resurrection, his ascension, and his exaltation like we looked at last week, he then in a unique way to his people is able to give grace. He's able to give grace. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians. What? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and, from, and also from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then at the end of the letter, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. He also says it in Galatians. If you didn't believe me this far, I got a bunch. Just wait. The start of the letter, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way he ends it in chapter 6, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brother. Amen. I mean, Paul says so much in these letters, talking to people about correcting things and giving them encouragement and such like that. So what a great way to end these letters too recognizing that what we need is grace and that God has given us a unique way to extend that grace through his son, Jesus, the great high priest, the great high priest. You want another one? Yes, I want another one. Ephesians, right? Ephesians, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way he ends it in chapter 6, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. He also says the same in Philippians chapter 1, and then again in the end of Philippians chapter 4. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now, Tom, before you jump ahead, what is the last verse of the Bible? It's in Revelation, but what does it say? Give me, a, give me the gist of it. Come, Lord Jesus, right? Come, Lord Jesus. That was my answer to what the last verse of the Bible was, right? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Well, that's not what the last verse of the Bible is. Revelation chapter 22, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's the second to last verse. The last verse in the whole New Testament is the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Isn't that incredible? This is, the, this is one of the last books that was written, this letter from John to the churches, and the very last phrase of the very last book, what will... What he'll hold us over until Jesus comes is the grace that can come from this great high priest, Jesus, who was tempted in all the same ways we were, yet without sin, and is able because of that to be sympathetic to our weakness. Grace indeed comes from God, but it also comes from Jesus Christ. And for any of us that are maybe like, that's a, a weird or a strange concept, that Jesus would be the one extending grace too. Let's not forget what we looked at last week that he has been given all authority in heaven and earth, right? That he is king, that there's power in his name, and that nowhere in Scripture do we see that there is a competition between the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, to extend grace. This is all about us living a life that glorifies God. It's all summed up in the end, and all of us, even Jesus himself from 1 Corinthians 15, handing it all back over to God and saying, all right, now on with eternity, glorifying God. And in light of all of that, one of the ways that God helps his people is through giving his son the ability to give assistance and aid to his people. Isn't that just spectacular, right? Think about this now. This is what Jesus said, though. In Matthew chapter 18, this is Matthew now saying something like this, uh, recording something like this. Jesus said, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, what? So if two or three are gathered in his name and Jesus is uh, somehow able to be there, he should certainly be able to extend this grace that we need. And I love that this is from Matthew, too. It's not from, like, mystical John, right? Where you're like, what exactly are you saying, John? You know, this is from plain-spoken Matthew. I love this. This must have really resonated in Matthew's heart when Jesus said this. We know what he says in the end of the, the gospel, Matthew 28, right? Jesus came up and spoke to them right before he ascends to heaven, and he says, all what? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all I've commanded you. Right? He comes. I've been given all authority. He sends them out to do this great commission, 
And then right after that, in the context of you're going to go out there and do this, what does he say? He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, for the disciples, and we'll see in the book of Acts now, this wasn't just some, like, uh, nice sentiment. This was a reality that Jesus was going to be with his people like he said he was. Imagine that. Jesus saying something and then actually meaning what he says. Don't we believe that about every other thing he said? Right? I hope. Right? Or we're on our way. This is what he says. This is what he says. Now, for a long time, I haven't sounded like this. I've said God's with me, certainly. That's clear. Right? But the Bible says that Jesus also will be with his people. I'd like to sound a little more like the Bible and a little less uh, like my comfort zone. Okay? In Hebrews chapter 7, you're still in Hebrews. Verse 23, <clears throat> still talking about this role as high priest. It says in verse 23 of chapter 7, The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by that thing we call death from continuing. There were a lot of priests. You know why? Because you run out of priests sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Just run out. You keep a lot on hand, keep them in the closet. You know, when one goes out, you change it. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. This assistance and this aid and this sympathy of Jesus doesn't run out when he dies. He already died and then rose from the dead. His priesthood continues permanently. Therefore... Because of this, he, Jesus, is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession. Remember those priests I said before were limited, right, in their ability to make intercession? Jesus is not limited in his ability to make intercession. He's not going to die. He's not going to get weak or weary or sin and then be disqualified like the other priests were. His priesthood continues forever. Isn't that incredible? That's awesome. That's awesome. Now let's look at some of this, how it played out in the early church, Acts chapter 7. This stuff is going to blow your mind. This, this has just been incredible, looking at this stuff in Acts. Acts chapter 7. Now, what I want you to keep in mind as we look at, at these uh, historical accounts is I want you to keep in mind these things that we've established about Jesus being the high priest. That he's sympathetic, that he knows what it's like, and that he can come to the aid of those in need. We're going to see a couple examples here about, uh, about followers of Jesus Christ being in difficult situations. And Jesus come through as he said he in chapter 7, we, we uh, hear Stephen giving his sermon, and he ends it out by convicting the heck out of his audience, which is always a great way to go, right? You men who are stiff, imagine him handing out the flowers to the mothers after this sermon, you know what I mean? He tells it to them straight. He says, you men who are stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. And you receive the law as ordained by angels, yet you do not keep it. This is his closing statement, convicting them. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. They were convicted. And they began to gnash their teeth at him. They were very angry, right? Listen to what happens to Stephen. This is probably not the best situation to be in. He's just convicted and preached against the very people that betrayed and uh, were responsible for Jesus' crucifixion. Now, being full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed intently into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and who? Jesus. This is one of the rare instances in Scripture where Jesus is not seated at the right hand of God, but he's doing what? Standing at the right hand of God. And then Stephen says, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they 
cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen. They're, gonna, they're killing him. And as this is happening, he calls on the Lord and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. When Stephen is in the most difficult situation that he will ever face in his life, who was right there for him? Jesus. He's sympathetic. He said he'd be with them and come to their aid. He did that for Stephen. Even though Stephen's life ended, Jesus was with him through the very end. Don't you think Jesus knew what it, what it felt like to, be, to have the crowds turn on him? And to have the very people that should have listened to him want to kill him instead? Did Jesus ever experience something like that? That's exactly what Jesus experienced. And he was able to come to the aid of his faithful disciple, Stephen, to help him because of that. He was the perfect one to come and be there and stand beside him. Look at Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, this is Paul now. Many years later, he's in the city of Corinth. And the city of Corinth, he, he, uh, he got some resistance. Verse 5, when, Paul and, uh, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. He's preaching the gospel, and he's solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. So he's going out for this great commission. Is he received well by his audience? No. So he goes now, verse 7. He left there and went to a house of a man named Titius Justus, who was a worshiper of who? Worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Now Crispus was the leader of the synagogue, and he believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Why? Verse 10. Why? For I am with you. For I am with you, and no man will attack you to harm you. For I have many people in this city. And there he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God. Paul, in a, in a situation where he could have been afraid, when he could have been, been tempted to, to fear and worry, the Lord comes to him and says that very phrase that we heard him say in his earthly ministry, I am what? With you. Don't be afraid. You think Jesus understood what it was like to be in a town where people weren't going to receive him? Where potentially they would do harm to him? Absolutely. He went through that very thing. to Paul's aid at this time and tell him, stick it out, brother. I got a lot of people here for you. You just keep on preaching the gospel. Man, that's phenomenal. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is what they experienced. They experienced that Jesus would be with them, that he would give this help.
about this grace. Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. Paul, in uh, the end of 2 Corinthians, tells a story about how he got a vision of what it was going to be like in the kingdom. That he was almost, that he was like translated there to see what it was going to be. So Paul, Paul sees his great vision, and he says in verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the, the revelations, of the vision that I received, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. If you saw a vision, right, you experienced the vision of what it was going to be like in the kingdom of God, you would not be able to update your Facebook status fast enough, right? You'd be coming into the church and telling everybody what you saw. Paul wanted to have that same thing, and I'm sure he did tell people what it was going to be like. But so that he wouldn't get cocky, that he wouldn't exalt himself, even though he had this special experience, it says that a thorn in the flesh was given him, something very difficult, a messenger of Satan to torment him, to keep him from exalting himself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that he might leave me. And he, the Lord, said to me, my what? There's that word again. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And Paul says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of who? So that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul is suffering He's being afflicted by this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan. He asked the Lord if it could be removed, and the Lord says, no, my power is all that you'll need. My grace is sufficient for you. Jesus extends grace to those who are in need, and he did that for his man Paul in the most difficult situation he would have been in. So this thorn in the flesh. Maybe it was a physical ailment. Maybe it was a demonic torment. Maybe it was, was an evil person. You think Jesus know how to, knew how to deal with physical challenges? You think Jesus knew how to deal with demons? You think Jesus knew how to deal with people that weren't very nice? So no matter what it was, Jesus is the perfect one to give this grace to Paul in his time of need. Jesus said he was going to do it. And to Stephen and to Paul and to the disciples, guess what? He did it. He did it. He did it. 2 Timothy. This is the end of Paul's life. 2 Timothy. He was with them in the beginning of his ministry. He was with them at the end of this ministry. Because Jesus said, I will be with you always. Paul ends this letter here in 2 Timothy. Uh, Timothy. He gives some final words. He, he tells Timothy that you know a lot of people have left him. Demas deserted him. Only Luke is with me in verse 11. He has him pick up some of the things that he needs. And then he says in verse 14 that a man named Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Not much insight into who this man Alexander was, but perhaps he was a former brother, a former companion, and he turned on him. Whoever he was, he did him much harm. But the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. He tells Timothy, be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Then Paul says this, at my first defense, no one supported me. No one supported me. All of his friends, all of his companions, all of the churches that he had reached out to and ministered to and brought the gospel to, when he was standing before the court, he had nobody on his side. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But verse 17, but, but what? But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Everybody left him. 
all of his friends, all of his family, everyone that should have been there, if they, if they hadn't already uh, turned away from him, when it was time for him to stand before the court, they deserted him. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through the proclamation that it might be fully accomplished that the Gentiles might hear, I was rescued out of the lion. Man, at the end of Paul's life, when he's all alone, the very promise that Jesus made to his church rings true. I will be with you. I will be with you. Do you think Jesus can sympathize with having to stand before a court with all of his close friends and companions deserting him? Do you think Jesus can sympathize with that? Absolutely. That's the very thing that happened to him. He's the perfect one for God to ascend to help Paul in this time of need, to strengthen him. Paul, I've been there. I know what it's like. You can stick it out. My kingdom's coming. You just hold tight, brother. Doesn't matter what happens to them now. I am the resurrection and the life. I'll raise you from the dead. You just stick it out, brother. You stay faithful to me. The time of the end is almost coming. Whoo, strength from Jesus himself. The very one tempted was right there at Paul's, at Paul's time of need to strengthen him. To strengthen him. Now, here's where your devil's advocate voice comes into your head. And, oh, that was Paul. Paul had a unique and special ministry. And so the Lord Jesus uh, was sent by the Father to help him in these time of need. Is it true that Paul had a special and unique ministry? Absolutely. But you know what? So does Jesus. And Jesus' special and unique ministry isn't just to Paul. It's to all of those who call upon his name. To be a Lord and Savior, not just in this life when we first turn to him and in the kingdom when he comes, but to be with his people in the meantime as a great high priest who is sympathetic to not just the weaknesses of Paul, but to all of his people. And he is able to come to the aid of those in need, just at the right time. Just at the right time. So, in light of this, there's the theology. That's, that's the teaching of the Bible on this circumstance, on this situation. So how does that help us practically in light of the context of looking to Jesus so that we don't grow weary and faint? I shouldn't have to explain that because I think it speaks for itself. That's all the strength I need. But let's remember what he said in Hebrews. Sticking verses here. This is where it practically comes together. He was made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things that pertain to God to make propitiation for the sins of people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. That's, that's all I need. He was tempted in everything I was, everything I will be. He overcame it. And he, Jesus, is able to come to my aid to help me to overcome just like me. Chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. How about worship team? Come on. All things as we are, yet without sin. So the writer of Hebrews admonishes us this morning, Therefore, in light of this, because we have a great high priest, what should we do? We should draw near with confidence. Draw near with confidence to that throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And you know what, what I thought when I was reading this? I thought, if God has provided Jesus as a high priest for me, the one who has been tempted in all the points that I will ever face. Any situation that I'm going to go through that's going to be difficult for me, Jesus went through those situations, and 
He overcomes. He knows the way out. He's sympathetic to that situation. No matter what's going to come in this life. So what, what he put on my heart was, if that's the truth, what can't I do for God? What can't we do for God? Where can't we go with this gospel? What place, what, what situation, what person, what uh, obstacle can we not confront and face and step out of that comfort zone? If Jesus is going to be with us, we can do whatever he's calling us to do. He is sympathetic to these situations. He overcame these situations. And if you or I are in need, he will come and help us. We don't need anything else. God has provided through Jesus all that we will need to be able to overcome in this life. He is a great high priest. He is a faithful high priest. He is a sympathetic high priest. And he is a high priest who knows what it's like, and he will be with you. He will be with us always, even to the end of the age.